Good morning. I see uh, faces that are uh, very bright and awake. I think the coffee did its work this morning. Uh, I want to start by thanking Annalise and her team, uh, not just for inviting me, uh, but for, uh, I think, finishing a very exciting project uh, that I have been following from a distance. Uh, and so we just had a very nice uh, preview of the many things that they did. They have, of course, also written many things that I encourage you to read. Uh, and what I will be doing here is uh, maybe something entirely different, uh, but connected. And uh, I will not make the connections explicit. I will uh, maybe provoke you a little bit. Uh, and what I want to do is uh, not to rehash what I have written. Uh, you can just uh, write what I have written. I want to present what I have not yet written, what is up in my mind. So these ideas are not totally fresh. And I want to uh, use this opportunity to actually see uh, you just had a, a a very nice explanation of how mobility studies, what it can do to deaf studies and what this integration can bring to. Uh, I want to take that actually a step further by uh, maybe reflecting a little bit more on what mobility is and what it does. And so, uh, so the reason why I was asked here to speak is because I have uh, in the past also uh, written and did a lot of, uh, done a lot of research on very similar things, uh, migrants, uh, tourists, exchange students, volunteers, uh, people who attend conferences, so, so uh, very similar uh, kind of, of research. Uh, and what I have put up here is a book series that I edit, and for people who are not familiar with this field of mobility studies, what is this? Uh, I can recommend you to have a look at, at the books to see the variety of, of topics uh, that can be, be covered. Uh, but I want to focus a little bit on maybe where I think uh, mobility studies and where a lot of research will be heading in the, in the future. And uh, it has everything to do with uh, the rapidly changing world in which we are living. Uh, I don't need to tell you that the world is changing rapidly and also in our research we will need to uh, make changes. And so what I want to do in this uh, half an hour, and I will uh, stick to the time, is to uh, just provoke a little bit and, and launch some ideas, and I hope that during the breaks and afterwards we can continue exchanging uh, where this all may be heading. And so uh, what you have seen also in the previous presentation is um, what I would think most mobility research so far has been, been about, uh, very much centered on the human, and this is of course what a lot of our research and research in general is all about. It's uh, research about the human and the human that is moving. And what I want to do in this exercise is uh, also let, let you think uh, what can we learn about the world, and the world includes also the human, uh, if we actually uh, do research on different scales. Uh, and so I will be using, I will be playing with this idea of scales. So scales that are larger than the human and scales that are much smaller than the human. And so this is what, I'm, what I want to be doing here. So I start uh, by scaling up. So scales that are much larger than the scales that we are used to. Uh, definitely people in social sciences and, and humanities. And... Uh, the little picture that I've taken here is a picture from uh, the city of Leuven, where I'm uh, affiliated with, with the university. And uh, not so long ago, there was a big uh, festival in Leuven, and it was called the Big Bang Festival, to celebrate actually something that happened in Leuven uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, and that changed science uh, quite dramatically, and it has everything to do with the Big Bang theory. Uh, and I assume that most of you have heard about the Big Bang Theory. It's one of these theories that explains how the universe actually came about. So the universe in which we live, how did it came about? And so the Big Bang Theory is a theory that actually uh, has everything to do with mobility. The Big Bang Theory is a theory that says that uh, from the beginning there was a Big Bang, and this Big Bang has set everything in motion. And so since the beginning of the universe, we have things that are moving, including humans, but many, many other things that are, that are moving too. And this is something that in science now, uh, 
we come to acknowledge and also come to research because what does this mean? What does this mean that we live in a place, in a planet where everything is moving and everything is moving at different speeds? Some things are very, at very fast speeds, some things at very slow speeds. Uh, there are organic things moving, there are also non-living things moving. And so what does all of this do and how, how does it affect us as humans and how have we as humans affected uh, those, those movements? Uh, and so a concept that is now very popular in, in uh, science, but also among politicians, and you hear it more and more also in the media, is this concept of the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene is actually a term uh, that's coming out of geology, and uh, geologists have uh, divided up the whole uh, history of, of this uh, planet in, in actually epochs, in time periods. And so, according to ge geologists, we now live in the Anthropocene, and the Anthropocene is a time period marked by the fact that everything that is happening in this time period is heavily influenced by the human. So whatever humans have done and are still doing has a huge effect on all the other things that are happening on the planet. And so this includes also all these movements. Uh, and so I include a picture here of... Uh, something uh, that, ha that is also very much related to movement and it's uh, the era of uh, the, uh, the industrial revolution uh, and coal, uh, when actually coal was, was started to be seen as a primary uh, mechanism for fuel. And fuel uh, could be used for heating, could also be used to invent all kinds of machines. From coal you had uh, the steam uh, engine and actually, when I entered here, this building this morning, there's this statue of Mr. Watt. Uh, and actually, just before you enter the building, there's a little plaque that explains what this Mr. Watt did. And this Mr. Watt is related to the history of the steam engine. He actually uh, perfected the steam engine. So the steam engine has had huge influences in uh, the world, what, what it allowed people to, to do, and also in terms of mobilities, it, it uh, increased uh, the number of mobilities that people were allowed to be doing. Uh, and just uh, to, to, to show you how this area is still playing in our language, uh, there is the, the French word chauffeur, driver, but chauffeur, the French word, actually comes historically from the word stoker. And the stoker was a person that had to put the coal in the steam uh, engine. So, so there's many uh, words from that era that still play in our language that is related directly to mobility. Now, so the Anthropocene is something that you have all uh, maybe heard about. The Kinocene, maybe not. This is another concept that, is, uh, that was introduced by a philosopher, Thomas Nail. And Thomas Nail, uh, says that it's not just the Anthropocene, but we live in a time period where uh, there, there has never been so much movement as we have right now. And so kino refers to movement. Think of kinesiotherapy, uh, kinesiology. So everything with kine refers to movement. Uh, cinema is also moving image. Uh, so the kino scene is, a, is the time period that is marked by incredible amounts of movements. And so we are not just talking about humans, we're talking about all kinds of other things too that are moving and that are maybe moving at increasing speeds or at different speeds uh, related to what humans are doing. And I will be giving examples of that uh, later on. But what is very interesting is that human activity has actually changed other types of movements. Uh, and think, think about uh, the discussions we are having about carbon and, and uh, all the, the, the carbon waste. Uh, think about nitrogens. Uh, all these uh, entities are moving and are moving in different ways because of what humans are doing. And so uh, it's important not to just look at how we are moving, but also how we are actually setting in motion or changing the motion of all these other entities that are mo moving too. And what is very interesting that uh, when we are talking about climate change, uh, one of the things uh, that is proposed to actually deal with climate change are carbon markets. So this is this very complex system 
where actually countries and other entities will buy and sell their, uh, the carbon offset. So, so actually what they pollute, in, instead of uh, trying to solve it themselves, they will try to package it and sell it and let other countries uh, deal with it. So again, uh, a very complex human uh, way of, of uh, moving, moving things. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's carbon, carbon markets. Now, just uh, two books that I want to mention here, and I already mentioned Thomas Nail. Thomas Nail actually, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, wrote a trilogy of books. He wrote three books. I mentioned here just one, Theory of the Earth, uh, but he has others. Uh, and this trilogy is a reflection on uh, what uh, movement is and, and how it influences people. And I'm using here movement uh, before uh, we heard about mobility. There's also motion. Uh, these concepts are used interchangeably, but there are differences. Uh, motion is usually uh, used to, to refer to uh, something that is moving uh, and something that is also uh, being, being made to move. So, so there's not necessarily an, an, an agency. Uh, and movement, uh, motion is, is actually... Uh, can be studied also in, in physics. There are laws, and, and so you put, uh, you, you throw a ball, and you can calculate depending on the angle. You can calculate how it will how it will move. Uh, so this is motion, which is a very abstract concept. Movement is actually the most generic concept, and this is uh, used to refer to everything that is moving. Mobility is a very uh, human concept. Mobility is actually movement plus meaning attached to it. And you have seen in the examples also of the, of the project, uh, these are not just movements. These are movements that make sense to the people who participate in those movements. And that's why we call it mobility. So mobility is actually movement plus meaning. So M plus M is M. Uh, meaning plus uh, movement is, is mobility. And so these two books are, are reflections on, on uh, this whole set of ideas. Uh, my, uh, the, the Birth of Physics is actually a very interesting book. It's, it's a book that uh, reflects on the fact that physics as a science, but also it's a criticism of all the other science too, has been very much focused until recently on what is static, on what is not moving. And we can say that about many, many different disciplines. A lot of the knowledge that we have about the world, but also about the human, was based for a very long time on things that were not moving. Think about medicine. For a very long time, and still it's quite dominant, our understanding of the human body and what it does was based on uh, dead bodies or based on bodies that are not moving. Think about people who have to go to the hospital for scans MRI scans and you have to uh, lay in the machine, not moving. So it's a very unnatural way of uh, gathering knowledge. And why is that? And not just in medicine, but in physics and in many other, other disciplines too. It's because movement is something complex. It's much easier to study things that do not move. Uh, and so actually the example of, of the research also uh, proves that in deaf studies before also the uh, the focus was maybe much more on, on deaf communities that were not moving, but uh, if you focus on movement, you start seeing all kinds of other processes and all kinds of things happening. And this is what we should be looking at because this is what reality is. Reality is that everything is moving, and so we should pay attention to it. Okay. So uh, the big problem is that for, for a very long time, uh, in science, uh, science was paying attention to what was not moving or what was moving within certain, certain boundaries. Uh, my own discipline, I'm an, I'm an anthropology. Anthropologists for a very long time were looking at cultures uh, and so anthropologists would go to a particular place and would treat that place as if that place was an island with boundaries. And so the idea was that a culture is also like an island. It's insulated, and so you go to a place and you just look at what is happening there, and then you have an understanding. But once again, uh, this only works if you actually neglect the fact that even islets are, of course, connected. Uh, there are things coming to the island, going off the island, and the same thing with culture. Uh, 
cultures are, of course, influenced. There are things coming and, and going. We saw the, the example of, of Bali, which is a place that I also know quite well, uh, where there's quite a bit of exchange. Uh, many things uh, that are happening in Bali is an island. So uh, things are a bit uh, more, more complex. And so science has for a very long time neglected these movements. And so science is now recognizing something which indigenous people all over the world have been saying all along is that everything is moving and everything is connected. So it's very funny how science uh, is catching up with actually indigenous insights that have been there for quite some time. Okay, so these were just some ideas about these scales that are very, very large, very, very big. I now want to move uh, our thinking into a, a different direction. It's scaling down, so scaling down, uh, going to uh, levels of research and understanding that are smaller than the human, but also scaling sideways. Uh, and I will explain in a minute what I mean by sideways. And you see that every time when I have uh, a little new section, there's a little, uh, a little quote just to, just to make you think about what some people have said about uh, these topics. All right, we've already mentioned, we've already heard COVID. COVID has changed everything, uh, and sometimes it has been an advantage, sometimes it has been a, a disadvantage, but COVID is also a very nice example of mobility. Uh, if there would not have been mobility, we, we would not have had COVID, or we would certainly not have had COVID at the scale that we, that we experienced it. The reason why COVID had such a dramatic effect was because uh, this virus was traveling so rapidly across the world. And what is very interesting is that um, when you speak to experts on, on virus, a virus in and of itself cannot move. It's totally immobile. A virus only moves uh, because there are other entities that carry it, it along. And so in this case, uh, it were uh, oftentimes humans, it, it was the mobility of humans that actually allowed this virus to spread so, so rapidly. Uh, now, uh, because of COVID, we think of, of uh, viruses, of course, in a rather negative way. Uh, so this is something that has caused a lot of damage, uh, has also rendered a lot of people all of a sudden much more immobile because people had to stay at home. Uh, but viruses actually have been around, of course, uh, for a very long time. And it's uh, viruses also that have changed actually a lot of, of uh, uh, biological life. It's, it's uh, because of thanks to viruses that actually some things have happened, sometimes uh, positive things, uh, many times also negative things. So it's very important to actually uh, realize that uh, these viruses have been around and will be around. Uh, and actually, it's because of viruses and because of changes that also we are, we are what we are. Uh, there are lots of things that have happened in, in evolution, and some of these evolutions are, have everything to do with, with, with viruses and how they actually move around and are moved around uh, because of the contact between humans, but also between humans and animals. Uh, and so what we see right now is that, and COVID nicely illustrated this, is that how much the way we have organized our life has become dependent on things that are moving. And so COVID has shown that very nicely how all of a sudden when movements become more restricted, it creates all kinds of problems. All of a sudden, uh, certain products we cannot buy anymore in the supermarket because apparently we realize, ah, they come from quite far. And uh, there are all these issues now. So uh, uh, there's, there's, of course, here in this context, this Brexit. Uh, all of a sudden, there are uh, new restrictions. There's new borders. Again, uh, this has impacts on uh, what is moving and what is not moving. Uh, and so there are some people who have called COVID-19 the disease of the Anthropocene, or a very nice uh, example of Anthropocene mobilities. Uh, because, of course, uh, to a certain extent, uh, we have created or we have made that a problem like COVID can become as dramatic as it is because of, of human, human activity. Now, in my own discipline, 
and topology, and I'm moving now, so the virus is of course scaling down, this is at a very uh, microscopic level. Uh, I'm scaling, I'm starting to, to scale sideways, uh, and in my own discipline, people paying attention to movements and mobilities have been looking uh, recently very much sideways, and it, by sideways I mean looking at other uh, living beings, animals, but also plants, uh, and actually what is moving there and how that influences us and how we can actually learn a lot by understanding those non-human or other than human mobilities are these are, are being called. Uh, probably the most famous example in, in anthropology is the work of Anat Singh. Anat Singh is an anthropologist that has uh, done a lot of research on Matsutake. And Matsutake is a Japanese mushroom, uh, very tasty, very uh, expensive uh, and it grows only in certain places and uh, where it grows it's related to pine and a certain type of pine tree uh, and so this research that she has been doing but that also many other people in other disciplines has been doing has revealed very interesting insights about uh, what mushrooms actually are how they operate and that actually mushrooms are part of something much larger. The mushroom is actually what we see because the mushroom is, is what is actually above ground. But the mushroom uh, is actually a tiny bit of a huge network that is actually underground. And that network is called the mycelium. Uh, and the mycelium uh, is actually a, a huge underground network. Some, some people call it also the wood white web because it's related to, to trees. So this network actually connects uh, with trees so it, it, it thrives very well in an area of a forest. Uh, and these networks are so big, big that uh, the estimation is that worldwide uh, this network and uh, I can even, it's very hard to actually imagine how big it is. So people estimate it's 450 quadrillion kilometers. So uh, I think no one can actually uh, just imagine what a quadrillion is, but it's huge. And so these networks uh, transport and communicate and make that everything that is connected to, to the network uh, actually gets information. And this is very uh, interesting that net, the network in itself also moves uh, and it, it moves actually quite, quite rapidly. So, so the network can expand, can uh, decrease uh, and moves. And what is interesting here is that uh, mushrooms also uh, are not very mobile, but they use the mobility of animals, plants, humans to actually uh, move around uh, much more rapidly than they would if they would not be using those, those carriers. Talking about animals, uh, animals uh, are also on the move and the estimation is that uh, more than half of the world's animals but also plant species are actually on the move. This is something that we don't always realize. Of course, we, we see birds flying over. Uh, but actually uh, half of the animals and plants are on the move. And their movements are, of course, heavily influenced also by what humans are doing. So in, in many places, these, these movements have been restricted or had to be altered because of human intervention. People putting up fences, uh, uh, hunting, I mean, all kinds of things that humans are, are doing that have actually altered uh, these movements. And because these movements are altered, it also, of course, it changes the whole uh, ecosystem of which they and we are actually part. So, so this, is, uh, this is something we should realize. And this is why I want to make this connection between what I'm saying here and, and, and the research project and maybe also the, uh, the future presentations that we will be hearing. It's very interesting to actually try to uh, put your own research insights in this much broader context uh, where it is taking uh, place. So if we acknowledge and if we become aware of the fact that, yes, uh, we are human and we are moving, uh, but there are actually many other things moving too, and there's many other things, there's plants, uh, viruses, animals moving, and their movements being changed uh, by what we do, what does that tell about us as humans? And so I think uh, a lot of this research should, uh, should make us reflect about 
who we are as a human and what kind of place we have and what kind of responsibility we have uh, in, this, in this wider world. Uh, and so there is, uh, in the last 20, 30 years, also in terms of understanding of who we are and what we are as humans, also there, there is quite some, some uh, dramatic evolution in sciences like biology that uh, slowly is also now uh, influencing other, other science. And, and so one of the, the most important uh, things is that uh, the human now is, is recognized definitely in biology as a life form that is in movement and that is actually highly unstable. Uh, we always like to think of ourselves as something that is stable, but actually uh, all the science shows that we are highly unstable. Um, and this is something that the hardcore science is proving now. There's all kind of evidence that show this. Uh, phenomenologists, so people who are uh, approaching things more from a philosophical point of view, have been stating this for quite a while, that actually the, the being human must be understood first of all as a moving being, and so the moving also recognizing this, uh, all kind of things moving also within uh, ourselves. And so these insights now are corroborated by very difficult fields like uh, quantum uh, f f physics, but also, and this is interesting, uh, of course, this knowledge comes very close also to what in many Eastern philosophies are wisdoms that have been around for actually quite a while. Uh, and these things are being recognized now as uh, actually scientifically proven. Uh, I want to show you just one example of, of uh, things that have changed also in, in science, uh, because biomedical science are very influential. Uh, and so in biomedical science also now, uh, it, is, it is accepted that DNA, and DNA is seen as something that defines who we are, uh, so that DNA is actually not all that static, but it's actually very dynamic. So there's a lot of things uh, changing in our DNA and also from generation to generation. There are many, many changes uh, because DNA is so complex that, of course, if you move up a generation, there are many alterations, and so the DNA is actually uh, changed. Not only that, uh, there's, there's a lot of scientific evidence that shows that uh, there's a lot of material being exchanged uh, between human bodies. And one of the nicest examples is uh, what I have here in this slide. Uh, this is something which is, which is called, with a very difficult word, uh, microchimerism. What, what does microchimerism mean? It, it's basically uh, when a woman is, is pregnant, uh, there was already, of course, this was known that uh, the female uh, or the mother is, of course, exchanging all kind of material with the baby. But what was no not known is, is when that the baby leaves the womb, there are actually uh, things left behind in the womb from that baby. When there is another baby there, that second baby will not only uh, receive material from the mother, but also from these elements from the first baby that are actually left in, in the womb. So, so these are insights uh, that we actually uh, didn't realize, but that uh, make us reflect quite a bit about who we are and what does it mean when we are talking about identity, who I am, when we actually realize that this I, what, what is that actually, if all this evidence is showing that there's all these things coming and going and uh, these boundaries between who I am as a person versus who you are as a person, uh, may not be all that strict, and there's a lot more interaction that has also happened at, at a very uh, biological level that we are actually uh, realizing right now, and should us make us reflect about, about who we are. Uh, talking about uh, the difficulty of establishing contact, and actually in, in, the, in the, the presentation about the project, there were many nice examples, also, also in the films, about the difficulty of communicating, establishing contact. Uh, if this is already diff difficult between humans, it's even much more difficult with other than humans or more than humans. Uh, 
There's a whole kind of field. We have just heard uh, a definition and an explanation of what ethnography is. There's also a whole field about multi-species ethnography. So how do you do research with non-humans? Uh, and so also there, it's about finding a language of communication, finding a language of communication, trying to understand uh, how an animal uh, works and how you can communicate. And with animals, we can, we can still, we can kind of imagine, and there's actually quite a lot of research about animals, uh, particularly about, uh, w with pets, of course, because pets are quite easy and, and we, we kind of know. Uh, but just imagine how much more difficult it is when you are doing research on uh, trees. I have students of mine who are doing research in forests on, on trees. You cannot interview a tree. You know, uh, so so how how do you deal with this uh, from from a methodological point of view? And I think there, and I have been re reflecting when I was preparing this talk here. I think uh, in this type of fields, uh, people uh, like uh, deaf ethnographers or deaf anthropologists have a huge role to play because we need actually to have many different angles to actually actually approach these difficult questions. Uh, and one of the things is we have been focusing, of course, a lot on the senses. How can we use senses to actually approach uh, things that are outside of us? Uh, but I think we should also rely much more on uh, our body as a research tool. And our body as a research tool, we have senses, but we have also feelings. And so, uh, Feelings and senses are, are things that are related but are, are quite different and we need to develop uh, research tools that actually also use these feelings uh, in order to establish these connections with the uh, other or, or, or the more than human. Uh, and so I don't have answers here, like I was saying, because uh, I'm seeing that time is going quite rapidly, so uh, I just have questions for you. Uh, this is a last thing, rescaling the environment. Uh, so it's not just about uh, rethinking who, who we are as human, but also thinking about uh, this, this wider uh, environment of which we are part. Uh, first realization should be, of course, that uh, the environment is not something external. We are the environment. So uh, the environment is actually us. The planet is not something external. We are the planet. And I think the more we start realizing this, and I think climate change is helping people to, to start to realize that Things are connected, and it's hard to uh, uh, keep on neglecting these things. Uh, then the question about cosmopolitanism uh, becomes actually an, not just a, a cosmopolitanism between humans, but also a, pla a planetary citizenship. So it's not just about how we can be friendly among humans, but how can we be friendly with the whole planet, humans, animals, uh, planets. And so it's it's scaling uh, the concepts that we already have, scaling them up uh, just a little. Uh, and so you can see that many people are also feeling this, uh, you know, uh, this, this disconnect and the wanting, wanting to reconnect uh, with, with the environment, seeing many things going wrong, but having lost the tools, how, how do you do this? Uh, how do you reconnect? Uh, and so you see all kinds of phenomena you have, uh, tree hugging, uh, forest baiting, all kind of uh, attempts that people have to actually uh, reconnect. Uh, but it's, it is quite of difficult. And if I would have time, I would have talked about my own research. We just finished a whole research on the importance of uh, walking and running as, as ways to actually uh, allowing people to reconnect with nature, but also how, how difficult that actually is. Uh, but also, of course, uh, realizing that there is this, this whole planet and uh, maybe also realizing that uh, we have damaged a lot the planet and there are many things that we cannot control. Uh, we oftentimes talk about stewardship and how we are responsible for the world. This is a very anthropocentric point of view. Uh, I think uh, it's becoming increasingly clear that there are many processes that we have put in motion or changed, uh, but that we can actually uh, not stop anymore. Uh, there's many things, uh, global warming, uh, we, can, we can make sure that it doesn't warm up even quicker, but we cannot go back to making it less warm. Uh, and this is something that we need to start uh, realizing. Uh, 
And so one of the things uh, in order to actually address many of these issues uh, has to do with actually uh, becoming a part again of this environment and realizing that we are this environment. Uh, and again, here it's very interesting to look at uh, insights from many indigenous people around the world. Uh, and this is what this slide is referring to. Topokinetic knowledge, topokinetic knowledge. So it has topos, place, and kine, again, this movement. So if you move through a place, it's by moving through a place, it's by moving through an environment, paying attention to how that environment is communicating to you, that you actually establish a, a certain relationship. And this is what in many indigenous traditions has been very important. Uh, I just want to point out a couple. In uh, Australia, the Aboriginal people have uh, song lines, uh, and I don't have time to explain what song, song lines are, and dreaming tracks. Uh, it's actually uh, things that you cannot really see, but it has everything to do with the relationship that is built up uh, by an environment and by moving through this environment in a particular way and how that movement and the interaction with the environment establish a connection that is very important. And uh, it's something that cannot be understood if you basically uh, don't understand this whole, this whole framework. Um, in many uh, First Nations in, in North America, uh, same too, uh, uh, there's a very deep understanding of, of, of animals and how animals move. And actually, the totems that are given to people are very much related to not just the animal and what it stands for, but also the movements and how these animals move through an environment and how that uh, every animal builds up a different type of relationship. And it's this understanding of what those relationships are that is uh, being used also then to, to, to create and talk about uh, totems. On the African continent, there's the uh, concept of Ubuntu. Ubuntu is... Uh, as a concept that uh, stresses the fact that uh, movement is actually the principle of life. Uh, and of course, this is something that we realize, but there's a whole f f philosophy that is built, built around this. In Latin America, you have the concept of when living well. Uh, and this concept stresses very much that living well is not, it's not a human anthropocentric thing. You can only live well if you live well by building up strong relationships of belonging with the environment. And again, it's not seeing the human as, as something different from the environment. Uh, the human is part and parcel of, of that environment. Uh, and then uh, very quickly, there's many uh, indigenous traditions that have also uh, developed very interesting knowledge that is related to movement. Uh, and I want to mention maybe just two. In, in West Africa, there are uh, indigenous communities that use termites as a particular type of termites, they actually use this termite to what they call to wake up the soil, to actually make the soil more fertile, they actually use termites. And there's actually many examples of how animals and humans create actually a, a kind of a working relation where both the animal and the humans actually benefit from this working relation. Uh, in Austronesia and in many of the, the Pacific Islands, uh, and this is known from, from uh, my discipline also, anthropology. The, this, the whole uh, philosophy is of life is built around things that move. Uh, and it's people that are moving, it's objects that are moving, it's uh, nature that is moving. And it's, it's keeping all these movements in, in, a, in, in a type of balance that actually uh, creates a life that is Fulfilling. And so it's very frustrating, and these people are also very frustrated now to see that uh, these mobilities are disturbed by all kinds of, of uh, external things happening. Um, coming here to my conclusion, time is going very quickly when I'm just rambling off uh, and, and uh, giving these ideas. Um, so Rethinking life, it's, it's, it's one of the exercises we have actually ahead of us. Uh, maybe we will not solve it in the next two days, but we can make a beginning. Uh, and I think mobilities as a, as, a, as a lens, as an entryway, is actually a very interesting one to actually be uh, asking us uh, these questions and seeing how, how we can actually solve these, these uh, issues. Um, and then uh, something that I have been repeated over and over again uh, is the fact that we cannot longer 
separate ourselves from, from the rest of the world, uh, this actually, it's, it's, it's quite amazing how much time we devote on solving uh, issues between humans. Just watch the news, whereas actually the world around us is, is burning, but that seems to be less important than all kind of petty things that, that, we have, that we are creating among us ourselves. But what we need to be moving towards is this uh, planetary conviviality, living together. And so that, that requires uh, finding a language, finding a methodology, uh, finding uh, ways of communicating and find, find, finding ways of, of maybe uh, solving issues. Uh, and so two important concepts here are relationality, so, of course, of, uh, people need to uh, relate well to one another. And also, this is a big challenge. We all think that we are hyper-connected because we have a cell phone. But the cell phone is maybe the tool uh, that shows us how, how disconnected we are. Uh, and so, what does it mean to be connected to another being? Uh, and this is related to the idea of, of belonging. What does it mean to, to belong? Uh, and when we belong to actually a group, one, uh, one of the, the weird mechanisms is that uh, as soon as we, 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 we tend to belong, we also tend to create boundaries. And so when we create groups, it means that certain people or certain members are part of the group, but there are also other entities that are not part of the group. And so uh, we should be thinking about how can we create inclusive systems of uh, belonging. And with that uh, question, I think I will stop here because I've used up most of my time. Mm -hmm.